I have to tell you, ladies, um, I have the best line in the world when I meet people at parties or um, on the airplane. You know how you have that, if you're meeting a total stranger for the first time, you kind of have that, what do you do? What do you do kind of conversation? You know what I mean? And often I'm on an airplane somewhere and it's a guy who's sitting next to me and, and he says, so what do you do? And I say, I hope women understand men. And it's so funny because I get this deer in the headlights look some of the time, which is this, what are you gonna tell them about us? You know, kind of this, uh. and, and sometimes I get this reaction that is really telling. And I'm guessing some of you have heard this because sometimes the guy says, when I say, you know, I help women understand men, the reaction is, <laughs> we're really not that complicated. Okay. Question, how many of you have heard a guy say that? Okay, like I think everybody in the room. Okay, here's the news flash. It's not true, <laughs> actually. There is so much more depth, there's so much more going on underneath the surface in the hearts and the minds of the men that are in our lives, whether it's a, a husband or a boyfriend, or it's a male colleague, a boss, a subordinate, a male client, um, personal, uh, other personal relationships in, in your personal life. I mean, how many women in the room have a son? Right? It affects them too. Men are everywhere. And, um, <laughs> and there's so much that we don't, know, and we don't know that we don't know. And it affects us every day. And it's very applicable to what we're all here tonight as women in the workplace, women for whom stepping into the positions that God has called us to is very important to us. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that's very important to everybody in the room. And I know that Cheryl is gonna to talk to a little bit more a little bit later about some of those plans and purposes and some of the ways that that, that has worked in her life and um, in the lives of many women leaders. Um, but I wanna step back and, and step back a minute and start talking before we even get there about some things that really matter because, matter because there could be obstacles that we're putting in our way to stepping into some of those places that God has for us, and we don't even know it. So let me back up for a second and tell you how I got here, because I'm, I, I am a social researcher, but I sure didn't intend to start out this way. Kristen you know, introduced me, I used to work on Wall Street, I was an analyst for years, and when I, um, this whole thing started because when I moved from New York to Atlanta, which is where I live now, I had the opportunity to write a couple of novels. And um, one of the main characters in this novel that I was writing was a man. And he, the way I framed this character, uh, he was a good, decent you know, husband and father and a very successful businessman. That's kind of the way I framed this guy. And I will tell you all, as a woman, you really realize how little you know about how men think until you have to write their thoughts. I mean, I realized, wait a second, this is a novel. I can't just say what this male character of mine is doing. I have to put thoughts in his head. What do I know about what a guy would be thinking? And, and in some pretty personal situations, actually. And so this whole thing started because I would just, you know, kind of talk to a couple guys or, you know, ask my husband some questions or I'd be at a, a dinner with, with other, a couple other couples and I'd, I'd go to the other husband and I'd say, um, can I interview you? <laughs> and, and I'd say, okay, here's this scene in this novel that I'm writing. What would you be thinking if this was you in this situation? And as they started telling me what they'd really kind of privately be thinking, half the time I'm like, really? <laughs> it just, I found myself really surprised by some of the things that they were telling me. And then I, you know, it led to, okay, I gotta do more of this. And I did more and more and more of these interviews. And pretty soon I realized, whoa, wait a minute. What I was hearing, it wasn't, it wasn't just that it was really surprising. I mean, it was a lot of times really surprising, but that wasn't the big deal. 
it was the stuff I was hearing was really, really foundational stuff. The things that these men were saying were things that they described thinking and feeling every single day, multiple times a day. This wasn't stuff that happened like off in a corner once every three months. These were things that were part of their, their fiber and happened every day. And I'd been married at that point probably about eight years. So of course I'm like, why have I not heard this before? And, and I realized this stuff was affecting me and it, it answered so many things that had been confusing me in my marriage and suddenly like forehead slap about why certain things had happened in my career on Wall Street. And, and so I realized, wow, I really need to look into this a whole lot more. And that was the genesis for um, how this whole big project started. Since that time, when I realized this couldn't stop with just creating this novel, I had to, this had to be a much bigger project. There was, I, I started interviewing and sort of more formally surveying men, and then we did um, the project with women to help men understand women, and we've done these surveys at home and in the workplace. We've done the, the surveys now to help kind of parents understand their children. We've done so many more of these that now I have, let's see, over the last 11 years, I have interviewed and surveyed, I think I'm up to close to 14,000 men and women, seven nationally representative surveys to try to dig this stuff out so that what I can bring to you is not just my opinion. Usually, usually if it made it into the book, it sort of contradicted my opinion, actually, because it was so surprising. Now, before we get started talking about some of these things and why they matter, because both of those are important, I do want to let you guys know that I am going to be making some generalizations as I equip you in some of these areas that I've been learning you know, a few steps ahead of you. Um, I'm going to make some generalizations. You need to know that. If I, if, if I say 75% of men said one way, there's always gonna be exceptions. By definition, 75% of men said one way, 25% didn't, right? There's always gonna be exceptions. Everybody's an individual. The key is for you to learn the, the men that you work with, or if you wanna apply some of this over to your personal life, your husband or boyfriend or son, so that you can see this stuff when it happens. Okay, so um, this is, and this is really why this matters to us. Um, we all as women, we all have been given these great gifts, these great gifts of leadership. Cheryl's gonna be talking some about that. We have been given so many opportunities and we don't realize that sometimes there are barriers in our way that we don't even realize are there and obstacles that could be preventing us from stepping into what God has for us. Let me give you an example um, of, of why this matters, that we understand, and why it would be so important for us to talk about today, of understanding the men that we work with. Um, you don't realize this, but when you work with men, you're working with a foreign culture, <laughs> okay? When I was working on Wall Street, my job was to work primarily with the Asian financial market, and that had me working a lot with large Japanese banks. And, um, and I came straight out of graduate school. I made every rookie mistake in the book. And, and there's an example of something that happened that's a perfect analogy here. How many of you in any of your jobs or you know, living personal situation, how many of you have ever worked with Asia? In any of your, I mean, here on the West Coast, I would imagine that's a lot of you. Yeah, okay, so a lot of you have. So you're going to understand this immediately, the story that I'm going to tell. So I started working with these Japanese banks. I would go into these meetings, and I was usually the only American in the room, and almost always the only woman in the room. And I would walk in, and I would do the American thing with my business card. And I'd hand them my card, and I'd take theirs, and I'd go, thanks, and I'd move on. Now, I think I heard an audible gasp from some of you that have worked with Asia. You kind of went, <laughs> and you winced, because you know, which I didn't, <laughs> that the, in Asia, 
The presentation of the business card is a ceremony. And it is, it is very meaningful, it's very purposeful. You, you hand over your card with a small bow, you receive it by two fingers, and you do a very careful reading. Hmm. 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 You're reading the name and then phone number and the title, and it kind of takes a long time to meet anybody, actually. <laughs> but, but it's a very respectful way of doing this. And then you, you bow, and then you move to the next person, and you do that over. This is a little free consulting for any of you who might want to work with Asia, okay? This is, I did not know that when I was coming in and doing the kind of casual American thing of giving them my card and taking theirs and smiling and sometimes putting it in my pocket. I had no idea that I was sending a really, really specific message. It was as if I was stomping in in my cowboy boots and saying, just so you know, I am going to be running this meeting. And I really don't know, I don't really care what you have to say. I'm the alpha dog, I'm just putting you on notice. Now, sometimes in Asia, people do that on purpose. <laughs> They're doing that in order to send a message. I was sending a message I had no wish to send, didn't know what I was sending, and putting an obstacle in the way of a really good cross-cultural working relationship because I didn't know some cross-cultural expectations and perceptions that weren't written down anywhere, but they were very real and they were affecting me. When we as women work with men, when we live with men, but let's talk here, we're in a leadership discussion, we're in a workplace discussion, when we work with men, we are interfacing with a set of expectations and perceptions that are every bit as real as if we were walking into a foreign country. We have those too. When they work with us, we have those too. And we have to understand what they are so that we don't do that equivalent of the business card mistake and instead just have this positive working relationship as the default situation. So what I'm gonna download to you kind of quickly for the next few minutes are some of the key findings in this research that I've done with men in the workplace, um, which, like I said, is not my opinion. It was pretty rigorous research in the hope that some of it will equip you to know your audience as you're working with a male boss, a male colleague, men who work for you, and male customers and clients. And hopefully some of you will see a personal relationship application as well. If we have a couple minutes, I wanna dive into the personal relationship side of things because it, it does all, the whole thing also helps. Okay, we're not gonna have time to cover everything that I found, but I just wanna cover three or four kind of quickly and, and dive into a few of these, these things. First, big picture, there are two very different sets of kind of the best way of putting it is sort of the unwritten rules and the expectations of how things should work in the workplace that men have and that women have that are actually a function in many ways of our brain wiring. Men and women's brains, some of you probably know this, are actually structured very differently in some ways, not in everything obviously, but there are some really key differences that lead to these different expectations. And one of the key things comes when we say one phrase that I guarantee you every woman in this room has heard and some of us have said, it's not personal, it's just business. Okay, we've all heard this, right? Some of us have said it. We mean something very different by it when men say it than when women say it. There's a great analogy here in the movie You've Got Mail. Have any of you guys seen this movie? I mean, come on, Tom Hanks, Meg Ryan. I mean, how can you go wrong with that, right? So for those of you who haven't seen the movie, here's a quick summary of the plot. And it's a perfect example of this. Tom Hanks is playing the owner of a big kind of Barnes and Noble style uh, bookstore chain. 
Um, and he is putting out of business, aggressively competing with and putting out of business a small little children's bookstore on the Upper West Side of Manhattan that's owned uh, by the Meg Ryan character. And they don't realize that on, uh, underneath the surface, online, anonymously, the two of them have fallen in love online. They don't know, they don't share names, they don't share identifying information, so they don't know who each other is. All he knows is she's crying on his shoulder saying, this big bad man is putting me out of business. And he says, you don't have to take it. Fight to the death, stick it to him. Not knowing he's saying, stick it to me, right? And, and, and she's like, oh, I don't know. He's like, it's not personal. It's just business, stick it to him, right? So, so she tries and she gives it her best shot, but you know, she can't compete. And so he, she goes out of business and he realizes, oh my gosh, I, I love, I'm in love with this woman. She hates me, what am I gonna do? And he goes to her apartment one day to try to apologize. You guys probably remember this scene, those of you who've seen the movie. And he, he says, he, start, he sits down with her and he says, it wasn't personal. And she interrupts him. And she says, what does that mean? I am so sick of that. All that means is that it wasn't personal to you. It's personal to me. And it's personal to a lot of people. And what is so wrong with being personal anyway? And of course he's like, uh, nothing, you know. But that little exchange shows something very important about the difference between how men and women view the world and some of the unwritten rules that come along with that in the workplace. You see, men, you've heard that men have compartmentalized brains, probably. There's actually some physical truth to that. I wish we had time to get into it. It's really fascinating. But what it means is that for men, there's like two different planets. There's work world, excuse me, let's start here, personal world, there's personal world over here, and work world over here. And in their mind, these two things are two different planets, and they function by very different rules and kind of unspoken expectations and how things are supposed to work is just very different. It's like two different laws of gravity on these two different planets. And the problem is that if a man sees someone in work world functioning in ways he kind of thinks belongs over there in personal world, he automatically views that person as a little less business savvy. He automatically views that person as a little less leader-like, a little less of a team player. And it could be that this person is fantastic at hitting their metrics, they get great results, they're a great salesperson, whatever it is, but if they see them functioning in ways that don't seem, that seem to belong over there, they could be getting all the great results and they won't, in the man's mind, be viewed as leader material. Now, here's why this is a problem that sometimes, not always, but sometimes impacts us as women. We don't have personal world and work world, we have this thing called life. <laughs> and work is a part of life, but it's just one part of life. And we're the same person, and we function by the same rules in all of our different parts of life. We have these holistic brains. And so let me give you an example of why this can be a tension and cause problems for us if we are not aware of it. In a man's mind, one of the rules, the kind of unwritten, unspoken expectation rules of personal world, in personal world, in the man's mind, you're allowed to have personal feelings. That's what personal world is for. In the man's mind, when you drive across town and you get off on the third floor, you're in a different planet and you're not even supposed to have the same feelings as you do over there. Now, for guys, I'm quite jealous that that is easy for them. <laughs> to shut out those personal feelings and not quite take things personally in some ways. For women, we have these holistic brains and the way God has wired us is that our personal feelings are involved. And that's what provides motivation for us. But for men, they don't know that. They're very confused. Why is she taking this personally? 
And so what happens, this is just one example of what happens, I would be talking to, to, to people and, and interviewing and doing these kind of, I did all these sort of random anonymous interviews. I always felt really bad for any man that was trapped next to me on the airplane for two hours. Um, but I got really good data. <laughs> I got really good, I got really good input. And I would see this sense of puzzlement that led to then a sense of, isolation and a sense of a bit sort of sequestering the woman in question into kind of a different category in his mind because men would say, you know, with Bob and, Bob and Steve and Fred, I can give them feedback and say that report stunk and they'd be like, all right, try it again. If I give that same feedback to my colleague Susan, oh my gosh. <sighs> And so after a while, I don't want to give that feedback to my colleague, Susan. What happens to Susan then? Bob, or whatever his name is. Well, listen, she's a great utility player. She's fantastic at hitting her numbers, but not so much leader material. Now, sometimes they describe, and this is pretty common, the men were really eager to prove their female cred you know, and like really, I respect women, really I do, I know a lot of them, I've promoted a lot of them, you know. And, and I would ask them these questions about, would you, do you think that this person you've told me so much about is gonna rise through the ranks? And sometimes the answer is absolutely. But sometimes it was like, ah, good utility player, not so much leader material. And when I would ask why, it wasn't usually the metrics and the results and the numbers. It was this intangible stuff that they viewed as being essential to being a leader. Another example of this in this personal world, work world disconnect comes when um, for a woman, and this is when I do co-ed events and I'm telling men about how women function, this is another big one, because for women, we try to bridge, build bridge in relationships by bringing up personal world stuff at the beginning of meetings, for example. And the, the men told me that when it's another man and he's in a different planet over here in work world, and this is kind of where his brain is, remember there's compartmentalization that happens, and you, in all good intent to try to build a bridge, it's two o'clock on Monday afternoon, and you say, so um, Bob, did you and your wife go to the lake for the weekend, you know, over the weekend? The Bobs of the world told me that they kind of go, Oh, right, I have a wife. Um, <laughs> yes, yes, we did. We went to the lake this weekend. They're, they're like in this different space and it pulls them away. Now, that's not gonna be everybody, but this is an example of something to watch for. Because if you ask a male colleague, how is your weekend, and he starts talking about all this stuff, then okay, no problem. But if you ask, how is your weekend, he says, fine. There's your cue, okay? <laughs> and, and, and if you try to do what you're trying to do, which is build the bridge, you may be building a bridge, but it's not kind of the one you think you're building. <laughs> because unfortunately, he starts to view you as not being quite as business savvy. So that's just an example of one of the ways that we can have those obstacles in our way and we don't intend. And again, by the way, I should say explicitly, I'm not saying that you have to make any of these changes or that you have to do anything differently. The key is if you were going into Japan, would you learn something ahead of time about what will make you be received and viewed better and be more effective in that environment? If you're going into Brazil or the Middle East, would you do a little of this work ahead of time? Maybe, maybe not. You might make some changes. You might say some changes aren't gonna be me, and that's fine. The key is to have this knowledge in your head so you can make informed decisions and you see this stuff when it happens. Let me give you another example for this, another example of this, I should say. And that's the difference in how men and women view emotions. Um, it's no surprise that men are just a teeny weeny bit uncomfortable with certain emotions in the workplace. <laughs> and, and realistically, we as women, we view it as, if you 
sort of tear up, you know, if you puddle up, your eyes puddle up. You, we view that as being inappropriate and unprofessional too, right? Which is why it's so mortifying if it ever happens. Not that it's ever happened to anybody in this room, I'm sure. <laughs> but we all, you know, we know it's viewed in, inappropriately and we view it that way too. The problem is, I had no idea until I, until I started to do some of the, this research. I had no idea that there was something much deeper behind the scenes. That it was viewed as far more damaging than just as being unprofessional. There's something else far more important that it's viewed as. And I also didn't know, the second thing I didn't know is what is viewed as getting emotional to begin with. It is way more than just fighting back tears. So let me cover those two things really quickly. How is it viewed when men see emotion? It, it actually has to do with the differences in our brain wiring again. So let me just explain this pretty quickly. Basically, because of the male brain being compartmentalized, the female brain being more holistic and all wrapped up together, and there's actually structural reasons for this that we don't have time to get into, what it means is that men's brains are, men's brains are designed by God to do a function that essentially works one thing at a time, very deeply. And literally, it could be a thought, it could be a feeling, it could be some brain function. God has wired them to process it very deeply. And only once that particular processing is done, does it come out the other side and they move on to the next thing. This is why, by the way, jogging over into personal world, which we can do because we're women, this is why when you ask your husband, at night when you've had an argument, what are you thinking about what I just said? And he's like, I don't know what I'm thinking. And you're like, how can you not know what you're thinking? Okay, because he hasn't finished processing it yet. Okay, and the next morning he's able to talk about it. <laughs> this is what you're seeing in front of you. Okay, so on the emotional thing at work, what this means is that it is actively difficult for a man to process a thought and a feeling at the same time. It's actively difficult for a man to process a thought and a feeling at the same time. What this means is that their whole lives, they have trained themselves that when someone comes to them with emotion, all those feelings, or they feel themselves starting to get emotional, they know it's gonna interfere with their ability to focus in on the problem and think clearly. So they've learned this amazing trick that I wish we could do of shutting out those emotions to deal with next. That's gonna be number two thing that they do. So they can work on this one thought and think clearly. What this means, is that if he can't think clearly, when he feels himself getting emotional, he looks at you getting emotional and he assumes you're not thinking clearly either. Which isn't actually the case for us as women because our holistic brain allows us to do multiple things at one time. We're, our brains are wired for shallow multi-processing to be able to have a thought and have a feeling and talk about it all at the same time. <laughs> Which means in practice that I can be getting pretty upset. I can be having a pretty high degree of emotion, up to a point of course, but I can be getting pretty upset and still be thinking perfectly clearly, thank you very much. But men don't know that because for them, the presence of emotion means that logic has ceased. The presence of emotion for them, it means that logic has ceased. And so for men, they don't know that we have this ability to be able to think clearly when we're being a bit upset. And so they assume, oh my gosh, logic is leaving the building. And so I would hear these stories like the guy next to me on the airplane who would say, um, you know, I'd ask him a question about 
you know, something we were talking about, emotion, he'd say, I'd just give you an example of what just happened, the meeting that we're flying back from. And he would tell me a story of, like this is a guy who was a partner of a big consulting firm and he'd brought a, a senior associate who was a woman with him and they were in sort of an awkward kind of consulting firm situation because it was sort of a beauty contest meeting that was business development with a client, but it wasn't just them, it was a couple of other consulting firms all in the room with the client trying to win the business at the same time, awkward. And, and one of the things that would happen is that he was describing this other, these other consulting firms kept criticizing their firm. They were the big gorilla, I guess. And he said, my colleague, my female colleague, got really irritated that they kept getting criticized. And so she just kind of went quiet for the rest of the meeting. And he said, and I am so bummed because now she's the only other person from my firm there, and now I can't trust her judgment of the whole meeting. Wait, what? And, and he would say, well, I, she got quiet, and meaning she got emotional in his mind, and so now I can't trust her judgment of the whole meeting. And I'm like, uh, let me tell you how the female brain is wired. <laughs> but, but imagine the difference. This is, let's full, pull it full circle, ladies. Imagine the difference if this high-rising, high-potential, high-capacity, leadership-oriented female colleague of his would have just known this. She could have thought to herself, you know what? I bet he viewed that as getting emotional. And so she would have walked out from the meeting and she would have said to her colleague, you know, Jack, that was really irritating. <laughs> but here's why I think we're going to win this business. We, we can go $400,000 under the next nearest bid. We've got all the manufacturing capacity that they don't. We have Ted and Bob who've done like 20 of these. And she's listing all these analytical reasons and proving she was thinking clearly, taking the issue off the table. See how simple that is? It's not rocket science, it's just cross-cultural awareness. Now, we do have to know, and I'm running out of time, but we do have to know what it is that men view as getting emotional. You guys have been given a copy of the book, courtesy of Saddleback, which is awesome, and all of the sponsors, which is great. Um, so you'll be able to look into this a little bit more, but let me give you just one example. Getting defensive is viewed as a ma and from men is viewed as getting emotional. And I didn't know this. When, when I would stand in front of a whiteboard and I'd be presenting some analysis when I used to work on Wall Street, Wall Street and my boss would say, um, Shanti, uh, where's the year two analysis? And I would go, <laughs> well, remember, Gerard, um, we talked about doing the year two analysis and it would cost $50,000 for that budget package and you said we couldn't budget for it and so, and my voice is getting defensive and you know, I'm, I'm starting, and, and I didn't know that my boss is thinking, emotion is entering the building, logic is leave, leaving it, right? And how different it would have been if I would have said, oh, um, why didn't I do the year two analysis? Well, you'll remember, um, we talked about it, but um, decided that the $50,000 wasn't gonna be appropriate for the analysis, so. <laughs> Completely calm, it's a totally different perception. So those are just some examples, and I'm completely running out of time, so. Um, I, I know we started just a little bit late. I think I have about three more minutes. Let me mention um, one other thing, just to get it in your heads um, so that you, you may have a chance to start seeing it even before you have a chance to start looking in the book. There's something really important you need to know as most of us in here are strong, competent, talented women. Probably some of us have strong personalities. We have, um, we probably, many of us, have heard or seen this weird and really infuriating double standard where a strong and competent man is viewed as assertive and a strong and competent woman is viewed as a something else. And, <laughs> And I have had, we, we have clients, we go all over to different corporate environments and women's leadership conferences, and I had a global HR director tell me that they did, an, they did a retention study, and they looked at all the women that had left their, this, 
big company in the last three years, and that 50% of the women that had left were ranked or in their file or there's some note that they were difficult. Why is that? It turns out that there is something we don't know about men, and we have to. In, we think men are so confident. They want this direct approach. They've got this big ego. Man, if you believe that, you will set yourself up for the worst perception ever. Because it turns out that underneath the surface of that strong, confident-looking man is this feeling. I really want to tackle a challenge. I really want to do great things, but... I'm really not sure I know exactly what I'm doing and I hope nobody finds out. <laughs> and there's so much more vulnerability underneath the surface that we don't even know is there. A self-doubt that we don't even know is there. It's a raw nerve and you can hit the nerve by this direct, what you think you're supposed to be, which is this direct, aggressive approach, instead of approaching something just a little bit different. Instead of, why did you choose that pricing, Bob? Hey, Bob, uh, I know you've been working on this for a couple of months. Help me understand. Um, what w help me understand the reason for this pricing. It's the same question, but it's viewed in a way that says, you have a reason, I'm not there yet, help me understand, as opposed to hitting that raw nerve. And again, we don't have time to get into all of that, but it'll make such a difference if you do that, um, if you have that cross-cultural awareness. What is the top advice that the men gave um, to the women on my survey? It was, really, it was really, really encouraging. When I asked the men, if you have, if you have strong and if you have talented women um, who are living and working in a world of men, what's your top advice for them, for us? And instead of like a laundry list of things that they wish we'd do differently, there was this kind of this you go girl kind of feeling. There was, don't try to change to be like a man. Just be yourself. I mean, even though it wasn't a Christian survey, there were tons of these comments that basically said, God has made you with all these amazing strengths. Embrace those. Don't try to be like a man. Because when women try to change to be like a man, have you ever noticed that they take on the most obnoxious characteristics of men that men hate about each other? Okay? And instead realize, one man said, look, it's about learning another language. If you go to France, you're not gonna be understood if you just speak louder in English. <laughs> you have to speak French, but you don't have to be a different person. And that's my encouragement for you all. Learn the other language, but continue to be the person God has made you to be. All right. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.